Um, so I'm going to talk about James just for two minutes, um, and it starts actually with Fei Fei Li. You folks know Fei Fei Li, right? And she was talking about AI, and people said, how do I get involved in AI? Because, you know, I don't necessarily have the background in, in computational physics or whatnot. And her comment on stage was it takes all kinds of people from all different disciplines to pull this off. And I could think of no one else that better exemplifies that than James. James started out as an industrial designer. And we were having uh, dinner the other night, and he said, Scott, I was a designer. The problem was when I designed things, everything I built for, it might be for a building or for a gadget, becomes landfill. And he said, that was really debilitating. So, he, and he, so when the dot-com crashed, so did James. And he decided he has to do something different. And he became more about sustainability. Instead of basically creating things that you actually manufacture, go into a, land, a dump, he said, how do we create sustainable organizations? And if you look at his history, his history is one after another of how do you do collaborative um, thinking between private enterprise and public enterprise to solve some of the hardest problems, like water, like going to space. And as he tells me in about, about 10 years ago or so, he, was, uh, he met this woman um, who was around the Apollo era. And they had a special tour, and they went by, and they, they saw some items from the Saturn V rocket. And the actual design. Saturn V, the big, the Saturn, the big the Saturn one. Saturn V, yeah, yeah. And he said he started to get a tear in his eye. Oh, well, it was like, kind of like a bit of dust. I a bit of dust. Not, <laughs> not, yeah. and, it, and he said, you know, it, and it turns out that he's a space nerd like I am. I grew up wanting to be an astronaut, so did James. And he said, I've got this idea, this idea of how we can actually help get us from where we are today and reignite space, the new space race, because you've got a partner with private enterprise. And so what you're going to see today is he's going to walk you through a blitzkrieg of one after another examples of where it's been working. And, he's, and he has a unique perspective. Uh, he's working with the European Space Agency, working with uh, the United Nations, and well, NASA on how this actually works. And now it's a bright and shiny example of, of how to do this, and I'm really excited to bring him here today from London, and I can't wait to see what you have to say. Yeah, thanks, so Thank God. you so much. Yeah, James. awesome. Thanks, guys. This, is this, this is good, yeah. Um, well, first of all, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a great privilege uh, to be here. Um, but actually, it's a great privilege to, record, uh, to represent this work. This is um, the work of the entire FDL team. Um, and this is the first time, really, I've been able to tell the whole story, soup to nuts. Normally people say, hey, can you come and talk about the moon, or can you come and... But this is the full-time, full, full one I've been able to, to do the, the full story. So, so thanks so much for, for coming. Um, but normally I kick these things off with a bit of grandiose Arthur C. Clarke. You know, it's any um, signif significantly advanced technologies indistinguishable from magic. But my data science colleagues sort of roll your eyes and say, listen, James, don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, ML is just statistics. Um, but it's pretty amazing what it can do. And um, uh, normally when, we, when I start these um, conversations, normally a few folks um, who are like, hey, what is AI again? What, what, what are you talking about? And it's perhaps worthwhile um, just to think about at the very beginning um, of a talk like this, just a reminder of what it is. And also how someone like me, who's an industrial designer, not a, um, a data scientist, although Facebook seems to think that I should be learning Python because I keep on getting ads for learn Python for dummies. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm somebody who runs AI projects. And so perhaps just a sort of useful mental model of how I think about AI. So if you're someone like me who's not a um, data scientist, you can think about how to do this work. But essentially, you know, we live in an era where anything can be digitized. Um, it could be DNA, it could be proteins, it could be um, uh, um, a meteorite, like, uh, like in this instance. And of course, you know, once you can digitize something and you have the data, you can train a neural net. And this is just a very basic animation which sort of shows the idea. And essentially what you're seeing here is a number of um, uh, samples of meteorites are kind of being loaded into this kind of probability matrix. That's really what it is here. And um, this matrix is learning um, and figuring out what a meteorite looks like. And meteorites are different from rocks. They're, um, they're sharp and jagged. They're not worn down by millions of years of erosion. And they tend to have this fusion crust. They're black. And so there's something that we can teach a, a, a neural net to recognize, and this is an instance, an example of a project that we did, where we did exactly that. We, we taught this, this learner or this inference model 
this probability bucket um, to, to do useful work. And then we um, put it on a drone and said, well, can we go out in the field and can we detect meteorites? And you might, may ask why this is interesting. Um, if you can get to a meteorite early, like in the first hour or so, or even you know, first, uh, first day, then you can get it before it oxidizes. And that gives you a pristine sample of um, the solar system uh, for much lower cost than actually sending a, a mission up to that uh, uh, asteroid and doing a sample return. But also, asteroids tend to, to cluster in different families. So if you know exactly where this uh, meteorite came from, you can figure out the composition of that family of asteroids. So it's really useful to, to get these um, meteorites early, but also um, to get them before the, um, the uh, meteorite hunters, hunters get them and, and sell them off to billionaires, which is another thing which happens. So this is the, this is the project, and um, uh, we put the CN, CNN on a, on a drone and then went and hunted meteorites. And um, this is, again, showing the power of these, these things. It, it found about 10,000 possible meteorites but it found the actual meteorite which we placed there in the field uh, with only two false positives. So of all those candidates, it found the one it was meant to be looking for, which is shown in red. I don't know if you can see that on this, uh, there we go, special new thing, there we go. And, um, uh, but with a very, very low failure rate. So this is the era we're in, where if you have enough training data and you can train one of these learners, you can uh, do amazing things. And really, this is the, um, unfortunately, I haven't got a credit for this. Whoever did it is a full, complete genius and hats off. Um, but really shows the power of this, because once you've trained a neural net, uh, neural nets can see things. And of course, we have our mammal brains and our mammal eyes and our mammal ears. And we can't see all of the data that's, that's uh, in the universe. And we're very good at 2D and 3D, but we're certainly not good at multidimensional. And this is really where the technology gets exciting because we now have this tool for looking at multi-dimensional problems. Um, and uh, um, of course, space is the perfect example of this um, where the data is, we're getting is far beyond um, our mammalian senses. And so this is really the aegis behind um, FDL, uh, Frontier Development Lab, and NASA um, said, listen, why don't you partner with Silicon Valley, um, some of the best names in commercial AI and commercial space, and can you build a research accelerator to help us do kind of cool stuff and stuff as we're aspiring to do, like, like return to the moon. So here are a couple of projects um, which basically show how AI is helping um, think about going to the moon. And of course, we're in here in Silicon Valley. We're used to the concept of self-driving cars. Um, but we thought, well, you know, could we help with um, uh, creating rovers that are able to uh, be autonomous on the, on the lunar surface? But really, the first thing you need to do is build maps. And of course, there are no maps on the moon. And this is one of our NASA colleagues explaining the problem. And that kind of area he's looking at is about the size of Switzerland. And you think about um, a rover, which is perhaps the size of an icebox. You know, we, we can see sort of space of the macro, but that detail that's needed for a rover to actually navigate craters and um, slopes and, and all these other um, potential pitfalls, we don't have those maps yet. And so we asked ourselves, could we, could we use AI to, to do this? Because it's a really massively time-consuming problem. In fact, we figured out it would take about a thousand years for one intern at 20, 20 minutes an image um, to do this because uh, at the poles, the light is changing. The incidence of light means that the shadows are very long. Um, uh, it's a particularly difficult thing to do. It just takes a lot of time. And so we thought, well, listen, let's see if we can get an AI to do this. And um, first of all, we needed to sort of tag the, the images. But of course, there's no ground truth. There's no training data. And uh, talking to you guys, you'll know that that's kind of one of the most important things of an AI project. So we built this um, with the help of our friends at Intel. We built this uh, game, citizen science game, that allows uh, citizens to um, help the CNN, the neural net, figure out where craters are. And so in the process, we are training um, uh, how to, to identify craters on the moon and start building these maps. So just to give you a sort of sense of what that achieved, um, uh, 100 times speed up, same kind of efficacy, if you like, as a human, 98.4 agreement compared to a human. But of course, that's on one laptop. So you can imagine as soon as we put this on a big cluster, we can solve this problem pretty quickly. And this is, again, showing the power of these tools. Um, and uh, and th we thought, well, OK, now we can build maps. Um, the next problem 
is um, once the rover's on the moon, um, the next problem is there's, there's no GPS. So how do we know where the rover is? And so, you know, this is the, you know, the, 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 the question, you know, where am, where am I? Can we use artificial intelligence to help localize? And so again, you know, one of the, the missing ingredients here is training data. And so what the team did is they imagined a rover um, approximately this high and all the views around that rover, and they um, created a synthetic moon, uh, 2.4 million uh, 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 images, and they built a neural net that was able to essentially figure out a reprojection of those images from the rover and then match that to an actual satellite image um, uh, from the Lunar reconnaissance, reconnaissance Orbiter. You can see here the sort of the thesis is that the, um, the neural net is able to figure out exactly where the rover is by looking at this reprojection. And this work is still in progress, but again, it sort of shows the potential to solve this. And it's exciting because if we do this, we can do it for Mars and Mercury and essentially all the other rocky Rocket might be a bit harder on um, on Titan, but <clears throat> you know we can we can do this um, for for all the rocky planets and the and moons in the solar system. Um, but of course, you know these craters are cold. In fact, some of these craters in the in the lunar poles are the coldest places in the solar system, and um, that's where the water is going to be. If we uh, want to build um, human um, uh, bases on the moon and and have long term sustainability in the solar system, we have to solve the water problem. And unfortunately, it's in these very hard to reach places. And so <clears throat> putting a rover into a crater is a high risk proposition. And so the notion is that well, we could have a lander, which essentially is a relay lander, and that's somewhere safe, and that lets the rover go into these sort of dark places. But could we have relay rovers, which are essentially there to support the, um, the main rover and provide assistance if it gets stuck, a uh, line of sight for comms, and all these other things. But suddenly you've got a big computational problem about how these rovers will navigate through this difficult terrain. So the team essentially took this challenge and they created an AI called Marmot. And what you're seeing here is this kind of blue line, which is the, the lead rover. And then the, the yellow, little yellow rover, is, it's computing a path which is factoring um, points of interest, the shadow map, the line of sight for communications, the slope, because slips are a big problem in the lunar environment, and of course craters. So the AI is factoring all these different variables and figuring out a, um, uh, autonomously a, a route to uh, provide the line of sight for the, for the lead rover. Um, so this um, diagram sort of shows, again, this is a simulation, uh, which I like. Um, you can see the rover, I don't know if it's possible to see, yeah, it's quite clear. Um, it's kind of chosen this yellow region at the top, which sort of looks counterintuitive, but of course the yellow region uh, represents line of sight for comms. And so here the AI has um, decided that comms are, are the most important factor uh, between um, you know, providing um, uh, this sort of facility for, this, for uh, the exploration rover, which is marked S. So I think, you know, it's pretty obvious that uh, machine learning and AI um, uh, is super. It's, it's all right. It's so um, <clears throat> um, uh, super um, useful for um, autonomy, and um, I think we're on the on the beginnings of a revolution with that. Um, but one of the things about lunar exploration, uh, and this is it's interesting because this Christmas is the uh, anniversary of. Um, the Apollo 8 flight, so when you're on Christmas Eve, um, think back 50 years was the first time we'd seen um, uh, the Earth from space, and this idea that actually we went to space, but in the process we discovered Earth. And so I guess the question is, can we use these amazing technologies um, to help life on Earth? And we uh, partnered with the European Space Agency, and they said, you know, we'd love you to use our um, Earth data, Earth science data, to see if you can figure out how to use AI for problems that matter here. We partnered with uh, University of Oxford, NVIDIA, and their satellite catapult in the UK. And uh, I'd like to show a little film of what we did.
So it's pretty awesome, right? And this is one of the other things which is great about uh, ML is this notion of sensor fusion. So um, during a hurricane, of course, you can't see through the clouds, but radar can. And so this project essentially is fusing very high res imagery um, and fusing that with SAR, synthetic aperture radar imagery, and being able to create a portrait of what's happening through the clouds. And the notion what you're seeing here is a visualization of, of a sort of future application that we are imagining where we could provide this information in real time for disaster responders. So similar notion, this idea of um, data fusion, uh, the task here was to, um, to use uh, Sentinel uh, imagery, which is hyperspectral, high, high, high multispectral imagery, and apply this to very high res imagery of, of um, urban environments and map um, uh, essentially the informal settlements of the world's poor. These maps don't exist, yet 1.8 million people live in um, informal settlements. And so using this technology, we can start for the first time really getting an understanding of uh, where the world's poorest live, which of course has huge um, utility for aid agencies. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of people are saying, well, you know, uh, does uh, AI present an existential, existential threat? Um, I'm kind of going to go out there and say I'm kind of di diametri diametrically opposed to that, or not opposed, but um, at the other end of the spectrum, perhaps better to say. Um, I believe that AI is um, going to be phenomenal for the next, um, uh, next few years, and we're already using it to do this, to, to help defend the planet. And I just wanted to share a few examples of, of how we're doing that. Um, so this is uh, um, a little example of, of why. So this is the obviously the Chelyabinsk object, <clears throat> which. Um, uh, hit above Russia in 2013, I believe. Um, and um, you may know the, the statistics about this object. Uh, um, if it had been eight hours later, it would have been above Cleveland, um, exploded with the force of a small um, yield nuclear weapon, um, damaged the eyesight of about um, uh, 30 people, and uh, 1,200 people were, were injured by burns and other things. This is a huge explosion and it happens pretty frequently. And this is a small object about the, um, perhaps the size of a, um, a car or a bus, 18 meters wide. Um, and an example of a bolide event, so essentially the object exploded in the upper atmosphere. Um, and we're just starting to, to do the work of figuring out where these objects are. And um, I guess statistically speaking, because we are urbanizing more and there's more of us, the chances of us uh, um, uh, being um, affected by uh, an asteroid are getting higher all the time. And so, um, of course, NASA's tr tracking these objects um, and don't worry, there's nothing big coming our way. Um, well, not for 250 years anyway. But um, one of the jobs of the NEO office at JPL is to uh, track these objects and have a look at them as they go past and get a radar image. And uh, uh, why radar images are important is because if we can um, get a radar image, we can then shape model it, look for its center of mass and its shape. And that's important because um, its shape is affected by a thing called Yarkovsky um, radiation. This affects its orbit. So really, really um, uh, detailed orbit. So uh, you need to know their shape to really figure out your orbits accurately. But also if we want to move it, we need to know its center of mass. We need to know what shape it is. To do the work of shape modeling takes an expert about a month. It's a really labor intensive problem. And NASA has uh, 450, so you can see it's a, a big uh, backlog. So we asked the question, could we use AI to just to take this, these radar images and just you know, let's, let's do some shape modeling? So I wanted to talk about workflows because this is an example of, of an AI uh, workflow where we're using a number of, if you like, AI tools, not just um, machine learning, um, but also Bayesian optimization to find the center of mass, and then uh, variational autoencoders to essentially to create a synthetic data set to train the neural net, and then using GANs, generative adversarial networks, to, to fine tune the results of, um, of uh, those, those uh, autoencoders. And so again, sort of putting together these quite complex AI workflows, and the result you can see here is a beautiful shape modeled um, uh, asteroid. 
And so this is super exciting. We've got this workflow in pretty good shape, and I'm sort of hoping we can get to the point where it's sort of drag and drop at the Arecibo um, telescope, and we can have asteroids coming off the production line. So as mentioned, we don't have to worry. There's nothing really on the way which um, uh, to be worried about. But um, well, perhaps I'll yeah, quickly show you the results here. So this is an um, example of a radar image. And here's the shape model pulled out of that radar image. And then just to test that, that radar image, that, sorry, that shape model is accurate, creating a synthetic radar image just to see if it matches with the original. And you can see they've done a pretty good job of, of, uh, of, of working this. Um, but uh, uh, the, the other challenge is this other category of object. Uh, which we have less confidence about. And this is, of course, a comet. This is actually Halley's Comet. Uh, and these are objects that come from the deep solar system. They come very fast. And we really don't have any, any way of detecting them until recently. And uh, this, of course, we're very proud of because essentially what we've done is uh, create an AI workflow which looks at the, um, if you like, the ancient trails of these comets. And this is actually an example of one happening right at this very moment. You can see the blue dot. That's Earth. And uh, does anyone know what um, this trail is? Does anyone know what we're passing through at the moment? So actually, at this very moment, we're passing through Halley's Comet. And uh, so if you go out tonight, you might even see some uh, shooting stars. This is the remnants of, of, uh, of Halley's Comet. And we have an AI workflow which is taking all of those images from the shooting stars from cameras around the world. And through a number of permutations, we're mapping it onto the night sky. And so this is live imagery from, um, from, from NASA and the CAMS uh, project running at the SETI Institute, uh, where this workflow of um, shooting stars from these ancient comet trails is then mapped onto, the, onto, a, onto a, a map of the night sky. And this is, of course, the red dots there are the remnants of Halley's Comet. But why this is cool, of course, it's a complex workflow and it's now automated. Uh, but why it's interesting is this notion of dimensionality reduction. Um, and you can see here um, the different colors represent comets we know. Uh, but what's interesting about the AI, the gray, essentially are unlabeled uh, meteors. So the, the AI is now discovering um, what it was designed to do, um, clusters of unlabeled meteors, which you know, could be could be um, asteroids, but it may be perhaps um, comets that we haven't seen before. So this is um, doing useful work, helping to defend our planet. But I guess why it's, this is exciting is this an example of sort of a much more complex, multi-dimensional data set. And I think we've seen that AI, we know AI is good at, at 2D and 3D. But um, a lot of the problems we have at NASA and in science are multi-dimensional. And, and really, this is kind of where it's getting, getting interesting. And so I guess the question is, what's a good, hard question that we could tackle using sort of multidimensional neural nets or the ability for neural nets to see multidimensional data? And, and one of the questions we asked this year at FTL was, are we alone? Can AI answer this question? Um, uh, so I probably should say it hasn't yet, but we have a workflow which suggests it is possible. <clears throat> Can AI uh, help us determine if we are alone? Four easy steps. Find the exoplanets using the transit method, measure their atmospheric spectra, reverse engineer their atmospheres, uh, determine if the atmosphere is biological, biologically regulated. And this is sort of where we're at the moment. We're at stage, stage one of this journey. But we sort of know what it's going to take. And over the next decade, we're going to work our way down through these uh, four easy steps. Um, and we're going to need AI to really help um, this journey. And so this is uh, the first part of the journey.
so super interesting challenge. How do we find exoplanets in this massive data coming down from TESS? One of our NASA colleagues said it's, um, if it was paper, it would be the Sears Tower every, every month. Until recently, we've still needed humans to look for exoplanets. And this is kind of the challenge. You know, it's very noisy, noisy data. So um, the team thought about this for a bit, and they, they, uh, they figured out a new way of, of, of looking at it, because neural nets like images. And so what they did is they basically turned the time series, the noisy time series data, uh, into images. You can see here there's sort of um, three kind of layers of, um, of, uh, of noise, stellar variability, because of course the stars are moving the whole time, binary, about 50% of stars are actually two, and they create variability too, and of course being able to pull out of that noise an exoplanet. And so essentially what they did, their workflow, was to turn um, this time series into imagery, and they got some superb results, which I'll share with you now. So their method improved on AstroNet, which was the um, existing method. Um, they recovered planetary signals, which um, had been missed in other, in other studies, um, uh, with 96 precision on Kepler data compared to humans, recovered 90 more planets than the state of the art on the single model they worked on, but also, the workflow is 500 times smaller, and it works on TESS as opposed to Kepler. And I should have mentioned that Kepler, of course, is the, um, the uh, satellite before TESS, looking at a, approximately a postage stamp of the night sky. TESS is looking at 89% of the night sky. So we're really on the threshold of a new era of exoplanet discovery, and we're hoping that the work that we did at FDL will really work, support that, um, that uh, pipeline. So, of course, we're thrilled with the results and I'd like to thank um, the guys from Google and KX for their support in making that happen. Um, so, part two in finding um, if we're alone or not is measuring their atmospheric spectra. This isn't really an AI problem, it's a giant telescope problem, but fortunately, we have a new era of giant telescopes that are going to be launched, and this is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is uh, currently being prepped. Um, but it's not just James Webb, there's going to be a lot of uh, ground-based telescopes that have the ability to see the spectra of exoplanets um, and to get those very weak signals um, about what's happening. Um, but of course, um, uh, the, the task of actually turning that spectra into something which um, we understand the actual uh, component molecules, this is extremely complex workflow as well. And so what one of our teams did over the summer is they basically took this journey, this is called atmospheric retrieval, and they made a, uh, an AI called Inara, and essentially they built three million synthetic atmospheres, and they basically showed how they could build this AI pipeline to turn an image of an atmosphere into a breakdown of all the different component, um, uh, component uh, active chemistries. Um, the next part, um, part D, is can we determine if the atmosphere is biological regulated? And this is sort of a new idea in astrobiology. And essentially, it's like imagine you're an alien looking at our solar system. You'd see two rocky planets approximately the same size, Venus and Earth. They both have CO2 signatures. Now, which is the one which has life? It's sort of hard to tell from many light years away. But of course, it's this idea of biological um, regulation. This is the thing that you're looking for, and Earth is an example of a planet where life has essentially regulated the chemistry. The symbiosis between the chemistry and, and biology has enabled us to have um, uh, um, life exist. It's a process called exogaia. And so this is the difference between a sort of hypothetical Venus-type planet where the, the chemistry of the geology is separated from the chemistry of the biology, and you know, perhaps um, uh, when the Venus was a water planet, may, there, there may have been life, but certainly now it's long extinct. But Earth, we've been able to have this um, duality, um, uh, 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 symbiosis between the geology and the biology, and of course we have life as we know it. So can we look for this on exoplanets? And really this is what the team worked on, and they built an um, AR called Atmos 2.0, built in a lot of work by NASA already. And what you're seeing here is a simulation um, uh, you're probably wondering what 70 means. Does anyone, any biologists know what 70 means? This is 70 degrees Celsius. So this is the, essentially the temperature that, um, that life breaks down, enzymes stop functioning. Um, in the uh, um, you know, um, hot pools of the world, that's where you, you'll find um, uh, active uh, enzymes and bacteria, but really above that, 
um, the chemistry breaks down. And so what they're doing here is they're, they're looking for um, essentially all the conditions for life to exist. You can see here there's anything above 70 degrees really is abiotic. It's unlikely there'll be life there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, Gaian, um, Gaian planets are the ones that are regulated and essentially with their model they're able to, to look at the conditions for this sort of regulation. So, so that's sort of how you find if we're alone or not. And of course, we've got a lot of data to get. And, uh, but essentially, we, have a net, we now have a workflow and a hypothesis. Um, so of course, we've seen autonomy. We've seen that AI is amazing for workflows. And we've seen that it's good for multi-dimensional data. Um, but I guess the question is, can an AI make a scientific discovery? Uh, and probably the vote's still out on this. But we've had some pretty interesting signals with the work at FDL. And I wanted to share some work on the heliophysics we've done, uh, which is really focused on our star, which is huge, it creates a vast amount of data, uh, more data than our mammal, mammal brains can, can cope with. Um, and so it's a great opportunity for doing science with uh, ML and AI. And um, one, of the, one of the teams last year started looking at solar wind data and geomagnetic data, and they built an AI called Sting, um, the Solar Terrestrial Interactions Neural Network Generator, and they said, well, what's the interaction uh, between these, between the Earth and the Sun, and can we measure it? It turns out that, that physicists have done this before, and it's called the KP index. But essentially what they're able to do is show that an AI could predict uh, the KP index three hours in advance. And this is pretty awesome. And you know, a lot of heliophysicists have said, well, this is amazing uh, that AI can do this. But there's a reason why it's amazing. I'm going to show you this now. So this is uh, essentially all of the different um, data sources that were involved. Again, a multi-dimensional, vast number of data, set, data sources. And the bars in the orange are very, very small receivers, receiving stations that really shouldn't matter. They should be at the long tail of the data. But for some reason, the neural net was elevating them. And, uh, and what they realized is that um, the neural net had basically tapped into the fact that the Earth's magnetic field tends to bunch around the equator. And all of these um, stations in, in orange are on the equator, one in Guam, one in Hawaii, and one in Puerto Rico. And so it had essentially elevated the importance of these data sets. And it's an example of an AI making a discovery without any prior knowledge of the system. And that's super interesting because it makes you wonder what else we could do. And so, so next year, um, uh, the team, uh, um, sort of inspired by this, they started looking at solar data, geospatial data, and ionospheric data. And they said, well, can we predict uh, GPS scintillation? Why this matters, of course, is self-driving cars and ships and planes and now technological society, which is based on um, GPS. And uh, they were able to, to take this idea that there were some, some signals that were better than others, and they uh, uh, figured it out they, that the, uh, um, uh, all of the receivers in Canada were essentially were giving the pristine signal of GPS scintillation, and so they were able to build a model for, um, for prediction of GPS, uh, and this is it. And so this is pretty cool. So this is predicting uh, GPS disruptions one hour in advance. You imagine this for um, air traffic for um, so many of the things we depended on. And they improved their existing models by about 70% using neural nets. And this is kind of what's amazing is that we've seen that neural nets are able to improve on physical models. And that means that somehow the physics um, uh, can, you know, there's some aspect of the, of, the, uh, of the way we're building these models which isn't quite accurate. And of course, physicists will tell you, well, that's because we're using a sphere and not a, and we're building this sort of um, kind of ground up point of view of, of, of a situation. Neural nets come from the other way, they induce uh, a result, uh, but it suggests that there's an opportunity for discovery. And this is the last um, project, which um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about. I'm not going to um, talk too much because they still have to um, publish their results. But essentially, they were able to um, uh, fix a broken instrument on one of NASA's spacecraft on the Solar Dynamics Observatory using the techniques that I showed you before. And they're able to do it in a way which is far better, in fact, 500 times better than the physical models. Um, and this is where it gets super interesting. This is why we sort of believe that um, AI is um, you know, uh, a new era of, uh, of discovery. So um, before I wrap, I just wanted to say thank you so much to um, the folks involved, um, certainly our, our colleagues at NASA, at NASA Ames, the Space Portal, our colleagues at the SETI Institute, and we couldn't do it without them.
um, but also um, uh, uh, commercial AI leaders really uh, in the valley here, NVIDIA, uh, Intel, IBM, KX and Google, but also leaders in commercial space, space resources, Luxembourg, uh, Lockheed Martin, ESA, XPRIZE, Catapult and the University of Oxford. Um, but really the, the true genius of these guys, and this is our, our researchers, um, they do the hard work and I get to kind of get the glory sitting, standing here. Um, so this is our team from um, uh, 2016 and their mentors. Uh, this is our team from 2017, and uh, this is the team from this year. Of course, if you're interested in joining for FTL, we'd love you to, to apply. It runs every summer um, for eight weeks, and um, we'd love for, um, we've had a few Stanford folks join, but we'd love more. Um, and really, just to wrap, I just wanted to share some learnings from, I guess, my point of view as a kind of project director, not a data scientist, and how I, how I look at it. Um, and I guess the first thing, um, if it's not all obvious to this crowd, is that AI solutions are complex pipelines, often using multiple tools. And so this sort of notion that you can get a Python for beginners and start, um, you know, making the next Facebook or whatever, it's probably, probably, in my opinion, um, uh, I guess, I mean, Scott and I were uh, chatting last night and it's much more like climbing Mount Everest. You couldn't climb Mount Everest by yourself. Um, you need to have this sort of kind of pyramid of Sherpas to, to get you there. And, um, and that's certainly the truth, true of uh, AI project projects. And um, I guess the next learning is, um, well, this is really just point of the point of view of um, this, these AI toolboxes. And this is a, some, of the, just some of the tools that we've used at FTL, neural nets, uh, autoencoders, GANs, uh, Bayesian classification, reg regression trees, and T-SNEs. Um, and the point being, this is just about 5% of the work. You know, all the other work is data prep, creating synthetic data, um, uh, working with the subject domain specialists to uh, figure out the actual problem. Um, ML is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the second learning um, is that artificial intelligence projects are much more like making movies. And I think the, the kind of best practice of software development is still being found out. Um, but my, my sort of observation is it sort of goes into pre-production with the, that understanding the data, the challenge, cleaning the data, synthesizing the data if you need to, data if you need to, that's the pre-production. Then you have the production, uh, which is you know, figuring out the algorithm and, and that kind of stuff. And then you have the post, which is figuring out how to deploy it. And so there's the sort of stages of, of work um, and each stage requires a different expertise. And so it's much more like building, making a movie than it is um, uh, in a traditional software development. And there's this great quote from Google AI, which I totally love, uh, which is ML is like high interest credit card for technical debt. It's, it's, this is, it's hard work and, and that's why it's much better to do it as a team. Um, interdisciplinarity is key and I was trying to think of an analogy for this but actually the original data scientist you probably know is John Snow the guy uh, he was an anesthesiologist uh, and he at the time all the experts thought that cholera was from bad air but he was the first person to really use data to figure out the problem and realize it was um, a bacterial or germ um, microbe infection he's an example of uh, interdisciplinary approach to a, a problem and this is exactly how we think at FDL. How do we get people who know the problem but don't know the data, the tools, and people who are expert in this toolbox but don't know the problem, get them together, and that's how the magic is. Um, and then lastly, um, it's imperative that AI research remains open for the good of all. And I think we've seen there are some really good reasons for this. And the first one is, um, I guess, ethics, like providing visibility into what's happening is part of being ethical. And this is really important because um, you've seen here, we're using um, AI for comets and moon rovers and, um, and, uh, and uh, detecting GPSs. But in the future, we're gonna be using AI for life and death. And it's imperative that these things are open. It's imperative we can look inside and see what's happening. 
um, models need universal benchmarks on efficacy and dynamic evaluation because models change, data is dynamic, and we need to be able to um, evaluate these things in real time. And I guess one of the fears is that um, if these things are proprietary, then we can't look inside them and certainly we might not necessarily be able to monitor and optimize them without repercussions legally. And so we want to have a scenario where this stuff is done uh, for the good of humanity, for everybody. And so one of the reasons why uh, and we believe in this so strongly is we want all of the outputs, and this essentially is all our AIs that we've developed over the last three years, and uh, as we say, we do this for um, the benefit of humankind. Uh, we're going to put these into a, a resource that everybody can use, and we're calling this Space ML. And the idea essentially is it's a sort of combination of um, repository where training models can be monitored, um, uh, data availability, but also the DevOps for deployment. And so we're providing this um, resource where, um, where you know, this work can be evolved and built on. So, so yeah, I think, I guess in closing, you probably see like, um, I'm a zealot, I believe AI is good. I think as long as it's open, uh, it's gonna be one of the most profound um, technologies of, um, I guess, of our lifetimes. Um, but it's just fancy statistics. And with that, I'll leave you and say thank you. And um, yeah, um, yeah, open for questions. Apparently it takes 17 seconds to formulate a good question. And I, 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 um, I used to be a lecturer, so I'm, hopefully it looks like I'm quite relaxed. I think I got used to it. But um, uh, I'd, wait, I'd wait 17 seconds, 17 seconds, come on. There must be some good. Oh, yeah, yeah, over here in the blue, blue T-shirt. Uh, suppose you're like approached by an organization that wanted your uh, team to develop an AI for, let's say, more or less somewhat not as ethical applications, like let's say identifying terrorists at an airport or something, which means easily be at the border uh, not at the situation. What as a project manager, what would he do as a project manager? Yes, a really good question. So the question was, like, I guess, what's the implication if someone approaches us with a um, with a challenge, which perhaps is morally questionable, or or whether where the clear line of sight for human benefit uh, is a bit opaque. Um, I mean, I think. I mean, we we have turned down organisations that have approached us with like clearly the benefit of this result is you, <laughs> and we've said, listen, that's not for us. But I think it's hard to define, like the example you used, detecting terrorists at an ex airport, I'd kind of say that was ethical. I think that probably is an ethical application. But certainly, like, FDL is uh, projects where everybody benefits um, using space data. So even if it's an Earth application, it's from satellites that are looking down on Earth. And um, our, our sort of belief is that, um, uh, that we also want projects which get people excited, and that uh, that's the sort of category of, of how we think about um, the questions we work on. Yeah. Uh, so my question is very tied to the previous one. So is it on your bio, it's mentioned that you've worked with uh, counter extremism, for example. Oh, yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit to that and how you use the AI? Yeah, so um, the question was, um, in my past, I uh, worked in um, countering uh, violent extremism. Um, that was before AI was invented, so I, we never used AI in that particular instance. Um, but what's interesting about your question is a lot of the problems that we worked on um, are systemic in nature. So probably the, um, the way of describing that is a cybernetic. And no one uses the word cybernetics because people invoke sort of bionic man and robots and Terminator and stuff, but cybernetics is the, the study of intelligent systems. And you know, nowadays, we probably would look at that problem and say, well, you know, how do we apply AI to this complex system? And we're looking for keystones or, or high points of leverage within a system. If we can understand what the highest point of leverage is, that we can then more effectively deploy resources to solve that problem. And this is a ex really exciting potential use of AI is to find keystones in complex problems. And you know, the classic analogy is um, when you look at Yellowstone 
and this realization that the wolf is actually one of the most important um, predators in that complex system, you know, that's the sort of work that AI can help us do and um, I'm excited about that potential for, for this technology. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think you had a bullet that seemed to worry about proprietary yeah. software being developed and so on. Some people even worry about the data <laughs> being siphoned off to money-making corporations, yeah. particularly in weather forecasting and so on. Could you <coughs> expand a bit on, on the worry about maybe all, all mankind may not benefit directly, but yeah. profit-making mankind may have. Yeah. I think it's, it's a really good question. The question was um, uh, basically availability of data and you know, should that be made available for all and, and, um, and of course you know, there are some really challenging questions about um, releasing the data, particularly when it's relating to human health. And I think one of the things that we want to do is create scenarios where essentially there's a, there's a way of anonymizing that data set so all that we'd release is the inference model and so essentially there are ways of doing it where the data goes into the system the inference model is created then that's usable for other people but the data remains um, firewalled if you like and that's that's kind of a, if you like one way of <laughs> tackling the question that you sort of came up with um, and um, but I think it's it's really important um, it's People fetishize the algorithm. The data is just as important in the solution, um, <clears throat> and um, and certainly, like it's uh, you know one of the reasons why um, we talk about being open with the intellectual property for the inference model is unless you have like the data, um, uh, you know you can't do the work. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's sort of one of the ways we're thinking so, about. Um, yeah. In particular, if people are not really worried about it. They should read. The book, uh, The Fifth Risk, which talks a lot about the weather forecasting situation with data and politics. Yeah, absolutely. I think AI is, for those sorts of problems, the fifth risk problems is you know, very exciting because it enables us to see things that perhaps you know, we weren't factoring and give them a weight and say, listen, you know, it looks like this actually does matter. We should be, you know, the data suggesting that we should care about it. And of course, human beings when they're confronted with data and they can't be bothered to think too hard, they'll, they'll go with that. So, you had a question. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question regarding to your, let's call it alien project. Uh, is it possible to measure uh, kind of your, or to, yeah, to, to kind of collect the data uh, in, uh, over time so that you can actually measure something like pollution rather than just saying, okay, this is how the atmosphere looks like and this may be biologically regulated a lot? Yeah. So the question um, is a super interesting one, and it's basically <clears throat> if we looked at an uh, exoplanet for a, uh, for a number of months or years, could we see fluctuations in pollution? And of course that would be an evidence, that would be a techno-signature, because that would be evidence of a civilization as opposed to biota. Um, and um, people have thought about this, but um, the, one of the challenges is that that uh, even if you were looking at Earth from a um, number of light years away, you wouldn't see that, even if you had the James Webb, Webb telescope. We need to have the next generation of telescopes after that to see that level. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking for, um, if you like, the, the biodynamics between the big main molecules, because that's, that's essentially, those are the sig signals of life rather than those smaller things. Although some people have thought that it may be possible to see ozone, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's a, yeah. Good question, though. Yeah. yeah I know this training technology also do some work about healthcare. You develop the strategy for that uh, cancer, obviously. So I major in healthcare. I'm also a huge academic fan. So, uh, so I want to know what is your like uh, the vision, your interest, and what you do. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so the question was um, about the application of data to healthcare and um, you know one of the problems that we've been really interested in is this notion that um, cancer could be seen as a chronic illness as opposed like diabetes that um, cancer is something which we're now on the edge of being able to treat that way and um, not all cancers of course but a lot of them that we could actually use data and management to actually really 
uh, if you like, radically improve the, the likelihood of survivability. Um, and this is about the patient journey. This is about all those, those all, everything from early testing, better testing, all the way through to <clears throat> how effective um, the drugs are, understanding the genome, the specific um, uh, phenotype of, uh, of how that drug is interacting. And see, these are all opportunities for AI along this, if you like, patient journey. And so that's how we look at it, is that this is really the low-hanging fruit for AI working on these problems where there's a clear patient journey and it's possible to optimize that journey. Yeah, the back. Uh, about five years ago, I, I was in a meeting with, with a scientist from Google, and she said that uh, there will be a, an available transpiration map for the whole Earth based on, on data from Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. Yeah. Yeah. And that it would be available for scientists to do research on that to predict uh, food production, for example. Yeah. And, well, uh, how did this work? Because I, I haven't seen this right. available. So, the, yeah, the question was about, um, I guess, the, the, uh, the evolution of a plan to aggregate the world's Earth observation data in a way that was usable for scientists. And um, I mean, of course, uh, a lot of people have been working on this. And I know Google um, have, have a, um, a team which is doing that already. And I think that's fairly mature. And there's, there's Digital Globe, which is um, a for-profit business, which is doing this. Um, but really, the reason we work with ESA is ESA um, is all free. It's all um, available for everybody. And um, ESA um, have uh, really uh, about 12 different spacecraft that are providing extremely good coverage of the Earth every five days. And so if you are doing ML projects, I'd start with them. Uh, and, uh, but what's cool is we now live in a time where these, um, this data is now becoming more available. Um, but there's a huge amount of work to do. And if you have um, an interest, um, join FDL next year because we'll be doing more Earth, Earth observation. And of course, we're much more interested in, in um, uh, t you know, problems where you can solve, um, solve it from space. And, um, but a lot of this is about tagging. You know, one of the big bottlenecks for um, Earth observation problems is finding tagged data. Um, so yeah, that's the next, the next uh, push. I think we had a question over oh. here. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, before I ask my question, is ESA a uh, European Space Agency? What's ESA? Oh, um, the question was, what is ESA? ESA is the European Space Agency. Yeah. Uh, my question is with respect to the difficulty of explaining AI to people who are not computer scientists. Yeah. And more specifically, I just wanted to know from your experience, have you ever faced uh, pushback from, say, domain experts who are working on physical sciences or astro sciences, and then a bunch of mathematicians or computer scientists walk in and say we can solve your problems have you have you ever faced pushback yeah so the question was is there um i guess a, a culture of pushback um in some of the physical sciences towards if you like machine le machine learning driven science yes um and um and you know i think there's confusion what happens inside the black box um, there are you know, people who um, are saying, listen, it's just a simulation, it's just probabilities, it's not a portrait of reality. You know, until we have quantum, um, you know, it's always just going to be prob probabilities. Um, uh, and yeah, that is certainly a, a factor. And we, um, we've, had, we've had researchers who just can't get their head around it. It's just, you know, they, of course, they understand the math. They're smart people, but they just have like a, a kind of mental block with, with it. And so I think, yeah, to answer your question, it's, it has happened a couple of times. Maybe one more yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of um, articles and news talking about uh, in the future, AI yeah, will be dominated by the biggest companies, like the defense stock, Facebook, Google, Amazon, or Tesla. They basically control much of the data the training data needed to the AI. So I'm just wondering what's your take on that and do you see uh, yeah, what's your tools of your So the question, I guess, is <clears throat> um, when it takes all, which is yeah. a kind of classic problem, right? And I think, I think there probably is a bit of a, um, <clears throat> unlike 
10 years ago where some of the big incumbents sort of didn't get their head around Web 2 and they were sort of slow to react and this allowed a lot of entrepreneurship to sort of bubble up and, and disrupt. I think um, a lot of the big brands now have realized that AI is a disruptor and they've grabbed onto it. Um, and so the question is, is, is it going to be a winner takes all scenario because of um, um, the fact they have access to the data and, and uh, but it's interesting because in your question, the sort of the answer, because you talked about training data. If you are an entrepreneur and you have a methodology to get an AI to train itself, then you've got something. And I think that's the way, you know, I think there's still opportunities for, for smart folks to get, a, get an opportunity you know, to build something. Um, but uh, you're right, like this kind of the, the beachhead of, of data, data ownership is, is a significant barrier for, for startups. Yeah.